Good evening. I'd like to call to order the uh, September 5th uh, Dr. Cog board work session. I'd like to call the meeting to order. You get over to Connie for a roll call. Sorry, Connie. I'm being graded by my mayor, so I gotta. Eva Henry, Jeff Baker, Bill Holland, Elise Jones, Deb Gardner, David Beacon, Andy Wheelock, Sean Wood, Chris Williams, Kevin Flynn, Colin Clark, Roger Partridge, Laura Thomas, Ron Engels, Oh. Bob Pfeiffer. Here. Bob Roth. Here. Gary Vidham. Here. David Spellman. Aaron Brockett. Here. Gotcha, Aaron. Margo Ramsden. Ben Baca. Matt Johnston. Roger Hudson. Ben Price. George Teal. Jason Bauer. Tammy Maurer. Here. Catherine Hyder. Laura Christman. Richard Champ. Gail Christie. Debbie Nasta, Catherine Whitman, Steve Conklin, Carl Wink, Jeff Deacon, Mark Gruber, Drew Peterson, Bobby Sindela, Laura Brown, Lynette. Here. Got it. Pat Norquist, Storm Glor, Jim Dale. Here. John Rakowski, George Lance, Mike Hillman. Stephanie Walton, Berg, Dana Gutlein, Jacob LeBure, Gary Bean, Rod, Kyle Schuster, Jacob Lofgren, Barry Strock, Wynn Shaw, Jackie Malay, John Peck, Marsha Martin, Ashley Solzinger, Honey Sullivan, Barney's Drystat, Paul Azuski, Paul Sutton, Larson, John Dyack, Kelly Daigle, Roberta Mooney, Rita Dozal, Mark Laces, Becky Phillip, Herb Atchison, Bud Starker, Adam Zarin, Deborah Perkins Smith, Bill Van Meter. People joined us on the phone. Could you tell us who you are, please? Jessica Sandgren. There was one. Annette Kelsey. Sorry. Oh. Stephanie Walton, lost that. Thank you, everybody. I know we're a little light today. Probably the weather I'm hearing might be delaying a few folks, but we'll stay on time and on task. So if you don't mind, uh, reviewing attachment A, summary of the May 2nd, 2018 board workshop session. Is there any corrections or updates? And those will remain improved. Moving on to public comment. The chair requests that there is no public comment on issues for which a prior public uh, hearing has been held before the Board of Directors. Do I have anyone here for public comment? Seeing none, we'll move on to our next item. Discussion of the transportation ballot initiative. I'll go ahead and I'll let uh, Mr. Doug Rex go ahead and kick us off on that. No, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And yeah, small but mighty group today. I, I'm sure as, as the chairman suggested, weather is keeping a little, few people away. Haven't seen much rain lately, so we'll take it whenever we can get it. Um, so tonight, it's all about the November ballot. Um, we, we thought there would be a great opportunity to set aside a work session just to talk through some of the initiatives. The first, the first session, our first item, is related to the two transportation uh, ballot initiatives, now Prop, Propositions 109 and 110. We did invite both campaigns um, to this meeting today to, to present. Um, one. Uh, one of the campaigns, Let's Go Colorado, is present today. Um, the the other uh, Fixture Dam Roads color, uh, group um, uh, w was unable to make it, make it so citing a conflict. So um, we will provide a little bit of additional information about that as the meeting goes forth. But I would, just to keep us going, moving and grooving here, uh, I would like to welcome uh, Mayor Mark Williams from Arvada, who's going to speak on behalf of the uh, Let's Go Colorado campaign. And I turn the floor to you, sir. So 
first, uh, let me thank you all for what you do on behalf of, of the region with Dr. Cog. I served a short stint on Dr. Cog a few years back. I was also the understudy or the alternate for Lorraine Anderson when she was on Dr. Cog. And I felt a little bit like the Maytag repairman. You never got called upon because <laughs> Lorraine was always there. So uh, with that, let's talk about Let's Go Colorado and the yes on Proposition 110, which is the uh, tagline we have for this one. And you all have been familiar with what's been going on. Any of you have been involved in local government for any period of time know that we have a tremendous statewide budget shortfall when it comes to our transportation needs. And there's been a lot of analysis. There's been several of us who have been involved on this for quite a while. I've, I've chaired the, uh, the task force for the, for the Metro mayors and, and assisted with the uh, Impact 64 group and actually traveled the state when I was, when I was president of CML talking about the budget shortfall and the needs throughout the state uh, not just in the metro area, but throughout the state when it comes to a funding shortfall for transportation needs. We all know we've got serious problems with our infrastructure. And we also know that the legislature has competing interests and competing needs. And of course, the beauty of being in local politics uh, for us city folks is there are no Republican or Democrat potholes. So we're able to kind of put the partisanship aside, unlike what has to happen, at what has happened at the General Assembly. So uh, we've always relied upon the gas tax as our revenue source, and that source is dis dis uh, diminishing for a couple of significant reasons. Colorado set the gas tax to 22 cents back in 1991. It has never been increased. And we had a lot of people talk to us, well, why don't we just increase the gas tax? The amount you would have to increase the gas tax to meet what the needs are for this would be totally cost prohibitive. Uh, we, you look back to 91, we had about 3.4 million people living here. We had 28 billion miles driven, and we had about an average spend, expenditure by Colorado residents of $126 per dot driver for, for our transportation needs for CDOT. So that purchasing power, because of inflation, has gone down from a dollar to 54 cents uh, between 91 and 2018. We all recognize that. And then, you know, those of us who drove you know, 64 Ford Galaxies, or later on Mustangs, or I'll even admit I had a Gremlin. Um, <laughs> you know, fuel efficiency is dramatically better today than it was over the years. And so as uh, efficiency goes up, the ability to rely upon the gas tax uh, has gone down. And then, of course, we've got a huge growing population in the state of Colorado. We've uh, increased by 164%, the secret is no longer out there. Uh, Colorado is recognized as the place to be. During that same time frame, we've only increased our lane miles by 17%. So we've created quite the, uh, quite the rising storm of a problem between our transportation needs, the available roadways, and the other available ways to get people around to where they need to go. So when you put it all together and you look at what CDOT's needs, they have $9 billion in outstanding projects that need to be addressed. And you know, I'm really glad that Bob Pfeiffer is now working for CDOT and he's working on the smart roads ways to, to address some of those needs. But we have other types of needs that uh, are also going to need to be addressed. So we've got $9 billion in outstanding project needs. Our spending per driver at our current uh, tax rate is $0.69 cents per person. Uh, and we have a statewide gridlock. I mean, it's our quality of life throughout the state has clearly been dramatically impacted. So what has the coalition been working on? And this is a great coalition. I'll talk about it a little bit further as we go along with this. But we've had people from throughout the state looking at this issue. We've had people from mountain communities where their sales tax rates are quite high. We've had communities from the metropolitan area who have looked at this. And I can tell you that, God rest his soul, Steve Hogan and I pushed the metro mayors hard to try to get up to a full penny sales tax. And uh, the consensus was it was just going to be too hard of a, of a sales pitch uh, to, the, to the general public in terms of doing that. So we came back to the 0.62 sales tax rate, which was actually talked about by the legislature last year. And they could never close the deal. And so through this, um, this public-private partnership of folks coming together on the coalition, 
we've, we've settled on the 0.62 sales tax as the appropriate level uh, that we should seek for, for funding from the citizens of the state of Colorado. And what does that raise for us? First year, it raises $767 million. It's going to give us the ability to bond $6 billion, and we've got it sunset after 20 years. So it helps to address the problem uh, in a significant way of the $9 billion of needs. This takes care of two-thirds of it. I, I know we don't have anybody here from the think tank that is uh, proposing another alternative way to fund this, but frankly, what they're going to be able to accomplish is significantly less than what we can do with this with no uh, stable funding source to do it. Uh, one of the things that we love about the sales tax, or love, what we accept about the sales tax is that, you know, while it's, it's six cents on a $10 purchase, so the pain is not too great, but everyone pays, including tourists who come into our state. And that is a huge dollar amount that we get from tourists in the state uh, and they should be helping to pay for our for our infrastructure. So that's I think that's part of why we didn't look at the income tax, among other reasons, in terms of the polling. That income tax just uh, was was a non-starter. But by having it go through the sales tax, the out-of-staters who are into our communities to visit here are helping to pay it as well. So we do have a statewide uh, bipartisan coalition, a, a large number of groups. I'm not going to read them, but we have really, I think, worked across the aisle and across both public and private sector to get folks involved into this. So we do have a great statewide coalition. And I, I, I really applaud the fact from the metro area, our perspective was we need a statewide solution. And from the, the outstate region, there was a recognition that by us all working together on this, it was the best possible way to try to get to a solution. And then we also have a lot of counties. Now, I noticed that in terms of municipalities, we need to update this list because the city of Arvada has signed on as a, as a supporter. And I know there's a number of other communities. And we need to change your spelling on your name. Sorry about that, Laura. I will pass that on. And so we do have, and, and from the business community, a lot of other organizations as well. So. Um, I think it's an important aspect of it. For the cities, both at the, at the Metro Mayor's level and at the CML level, looking at a sales tax was, was a hard thing because sales tax is the primary economic engines for our cities. And so by committing a 0.62 of, of additional sales tax to uh, this effort, it cuts down on our ability to do some other things in our communities. And we recognize that, but we think it's the right way to go. So here's how the dollars will be split up. 45%, this is the same funding formula that went through the legislature last year that unfortunately did not get passed. 45% goes to the state highway fund. Uh, multimodal gets 15%. And that multimodal, again, through, I think, great work throughout the state in terms of, of uh, Impact 64 and other groups, was to recognize that that 15% is very flexible. If some communities want to use that on uh, fixed wheel, they can use it on that for, for um, call, and, call and ride, things like that. Others who want to put it into bike trails or into uh, other uh, improvements that will address multimodal type of, of transportation, totally appropriate. And by coming up with an agreement that those, that 15% is totally flexible, I think that makes it uh, very appealing to folks. And then again, and I, I'll thank the governor on this, on the uh, effort last year at the legislature, you know, traditionally counties got a higher percentage than the cities and, and everybody came to the table and said, let's, let's do an even split between the cities and counties for 20% each. And let me give as an example for the city of Arvada, um, and, and I think that you've got, the, you've got the sheets that show each community. The first year, the city of Arvada would get an additional uh, $4.5 million, which exceeds what we're currently getting through our our distribution uh, through HUTF. And over the course of time, it averages out to about $6.4 million per year. And I can tell you that for our community, uh, it really helps address our transportation needs uh, without having to go back to the citizens for another um, uh, sales tax increase for our local community. And I think you'll find as you look at your charts that you'll have similar types of um, gains by, by uh, the benefit that we as cities and counties will get from having 
these sales tax dollars in addition to our existing HUTF funds. So there's a number, and I think this is very important. CDOT has worked hard to come up with what their priority lists are. They've got 107 projects uh, around the state, and we all know that when we want to go to the ballot or when we need to go to the ballot, we need to tell our citizens what they get, what's going to be there. We can't just say, trust us, we'll spend it wisely. So I think it's important that we, uh, that CDOT has come up with some uh, a terrific project list, and uh, local communities should do the same as we prepare for this election effort. And we know in Arvada that we've got some projects and some, uh, some direction that we know that we would commit the dollars to, and we will be certainly telling our citizens that. So I'm not going to go through each of the regions, but there are indeed significant um, regional projects in each of the regions. It's spread appropriately and fairly around the state uh, in a way that, that addresses the needs throughout the, uh, the entire CDOT uh, kingdom. So I think it's going to be a great way to do that. Now for the local projects and our, our local ability, we all know how to spend our local dollars best in terms of we know where, where the uh, roads that need to be improved, uh, where we've got degrading road conditions, and we also know where our bottlenecks are. So I think it's terrific that we have local priorities and local needs that we're able to meet with that. And again, uh, because of the flexibility of those transit dollars, it does give us great opportunity. You know, I, I, for our community, uh, I think we'll seriously be looking at first and last mile uh, if and when we ever get the gold line started uh, and we can turn off the train horns. And then with the multimodal mobility, again, uh, there's going to be the ability to leverage state and local dollars for projects. Uh, and multimodal projects around the state. And uh, I think it's an appropriate way to, to address the multimodal needs as well. Um, and we've got a number of those projects that are on the state list for that as well. So add it all up and uh, get to the bottom line. We want to create a reliable revenue stream to support and complete state transportation projects because we're all in this together. Those of us in the metropolitan area rely upon I-25, I-70, and other statewide roadways to be able to get up to the mountains to enjoy that and to be able to move goods and services throughout the state. We need to have a, a comprehensive statewide solution. We can't just fix the metropolitan area. Uh, and it gives the, the ability to allocate funding to local communities across the state and give them the authority to make the transportation decisions for their own community. And it um, also prioritizes, I think, appropriately rural and urban multimodal mobility. So let's go Colorado. That's our uh, down and dirty in terms of what we're working on. And I'll turn it back over to Mr. Viper. Thank you, Mayor Williams, and I uh, appreciate it. I think we travel throughout the whole state, and we have congestion no matter where we go. It's just at different levels. So. Um, next up, we're going to have Ron Papstorf come up here and represent. Did you want to no, no, I, yeah, Ron is welcome to come on up. I, I just wanted if I mean I, I want to be respectful of the mayor's time. If there was any questions right now um, that that anybody have head of the mayor, I'm sure he'd be You're happy to entertain. You're questions. a better person than I am to my mayor, so <laughs> I wasn't giving him the privilege. But I know he's double booked right now, talking to the Godfather. So we're going to let him. <laughs> let him. Also, we're going to be handing out a list of the projects uh, that we're going to talk at the end. We'll hand those out that are impacting the Dr. Cog region. The idea is we'll just, we blaze through the, the projects there. We'll add to the end. But I'll respect the mayors. I know you have another meeting to go to. Is there any questions? If not, you can stay or you can leave if you need to. <laughs> No, it's, some of us felt like, you know, why sunset it? Because we're always going to have this need. Some of the polling says,
And thank you all for your hard work. I think we're blessed to have a remarkably well together. I'll have a great evening. Thank you. I'll, I think I'll go fight the battles of urban renewal. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. <laughs> thank you, Mayor, very much. So as, so as I mentioned, um, the uh, Proposition 109 campaign was unable to be here today, but um, I asked Ron Papsdorf, our own Ron Papsdorf, not representing the campaign, just to, just to highlight some of the uh, highlights of, of, of that initiative. Thanks, Doug. Yes, unfortunately, representatives from Proposition 109 couldn't be here this evening. So uh, Doug asked me just to quickly give highlights. You had some information in your agenda packet. Um, but again, Proposition 109, formerly Initiative 167, uh, Fix Our Damn Roads, uh, would authorize the state to issue $3.5 billion in bonds with proceeds used for roads, road and bridge expansion, construction, maintenance, uh, and repair uh, repair costs of a specific list of projects. We included the um, original initiative language that was certified by the Secretary of State in your packet, so you could look through that. Um, it specifically would not allow um, use of those funds for uh, transit, administration, or indirect costs, and other expenses. Um, the principal and interest payments on those $3.5 billion of bonds uh, would have to be paid, uh, would direct the legislature to pay that principal and interest costs of, uh, to pay the, the bond payments over time uh, from the state's budget. Um, again, that list of eligible projects that was in the initiative, CDOT's done some initial estimates of cost came up to about five and $5.6 billion worth of project costs. So compare that to the $3.5 billion of bonds that are authorized by the measure. Um, I think CDOT will speak a little bit to their process, but they're going through a process, uh, going through that list and identifying what the priorities of those projects would be using the $3.5 billion out of the $5.6 billion worth of projects that would be authorized by the measure if it passed. Um, also important to note that under the provisions of Senate Bill 1, uh, from earlier this year that if, uh, a, if a funding measure passes that doesn't bring new revenue to pay for the cost of that measure, uh, then the uh, last three years of the Senate Bill 267 um, funding that was approved in 2017 would go away. Uh, so that's a reduction in potential revenue of uh, $1.5 billion. So the net funding increase uh, under this measure would be a total of two about $2 billion to fund new projects under, uh, as compared to current law. Um, additionally, under the provisions of Senate Bill 1, uh, there would be no additional general fund transfers into the, into transportation, into the state highway fund um, if, a if a funding measure like this passed that didn't bring um, new revenue streams to pay for the debt service. With that, that's my quick overview of Proposition 109. Any questions for Ron? Seeing none, thank you, Ron. Stay tuned because we may have questions after we hand out the list. Uh, next up, I'd like to ask Executive Director Lewis and Mr. Stockinger to come on up and do your presentation next. <laughs> But, but Mr. Lewis, you wore your jacket tonight. <laughs> That's an inside CDOT joke, got to be. I was the only one that showed up without a jacket when I went into his office. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, Bob, Doug, and everybody, I appreciate you taking the time to have us come and discuss um, a comp sort of a comparison of these two measures. Uh, we recognize that... Um, that this is a very this is a monumental decision for Coloradans to make this fall, um, whether to to vote for or against 
one more or other measures. And the amount of, it's very important, I think, that um, call runs get the best information to make an informed decision as they can. People will have their own personal opinions, but I think that it's critical to get accurate information out to the public. The other thing, and Herman's going to give the presentation as we see this comparison, um, but the, the involvement, the local involvement in um, the, the, the work to generate that list of projects that the mayor referred to um, was really important because this is not a t this is not a top down exercise. This was really a bottoms up exercise. It's what is important in the state highway system, in the transportation system, in the regions all across the, the state, including at Dr. Cobb, that are that are critical to you. And then how do we equitably balance the projects across the state, investment across the state, because we recognize it is one state. And, it, and as I've said many times, it matters to Denver that Grand Junction is a healthy economy. It matters to Fort Collins that Summit County is healthy. And it matters to Durango that Denver and the Denver metro area is healthy. Um, it's, so it's, it's not, what I'm very fearful of is, and this, I'm, I'm fearful of this on a national level as well, is that we become islands of haves in a sea of have-nots. And that is not in the interest of the economic health of Colorado or of this country. And I think this exercise that we're going through is a litmus test. And are we willing to come together and recognize that it's everybody benefits, the economy of the state benefits, if we all recognize that this works as a transportation system and not as individual one-offs. So that's my soapbox. And I will get off of that. And we'll wear a tie next time, uh, Bob. But I'd like to turn it over to Herman to give you a, a, a comparison that we've done of these two measures. Herman, you might pick up the mic. Yeah. That's yeah. a little hard here. Uh, good afternoon or evening, I guess. Uh, my name is Herman Stockier. I'm the director of CDOT's Office of Policy and Government Relations. have only about five slides, but a few of these I'm just going to zip through. And if you have questions, I'm happy to go back and talk about them. But you've already gotten a summary, so I think really the comparison of the two from a dollar standpoint, which is my last slide, is the one I think that you'd be most interested in. Uh, CDOT does not have a position and cannot take a position on either of these propositions. We can offer a factual summary with pros and cons. So you'll see in the presentation that's what we have. Also talk a little bit about project selection, kind of a status of where we're at on that, and then really the, the funding needs and what the variables are, because there are a lot of variables of what could happen even beyond this November. So again, not going to go through this. It's in your packet. I think it's a good factual summary, because we have to, balanced on both sides of really what does it do, um, both Prop 109 and Prop 110. Um, so if you, if you need to just kind of quick summary in a one page, you can pull this out, and I think it's pretty helpful. Um, again, if you have questions on it, I'm happy to go through it. But I think this is just a summary of what you've already heard from, uh, from Ron and, and the, our mayor. Uh, again, pros and cons and a quick written summary. So if you just need a one sentence summary of either one of these that is fair and balanced, you can read the Prop 109 or the Prop 110 sentence or two summary and then the couple of pros and cons. Again, not going to go through those. I think you have those, but uh, if you'd like to discuss them, we can. I think this is, the, this is one of the more interesting slides here is, is where we at. I'm going to start uh, at the top with Prop 110. Uh, because Prop 110 didn't have a project list associated with it, we've spent quite a bit of time at CDOT and with Dr. Cog and our other planning partners and STAC to figure out what projects would we actually build if this were to pass. We feel like we have a responsibility to the voters of Colorado to say if this passes, what you know, they want to know what we would build. So we've, uh, we've laid that out. The commission in uh, July this, this year passed a project list that is uh, greater than $7 billion, $7 billion in projects. It's about a billion and a half dollars of pavement and then some contingency built in there as well. Uh, for Prop 109, the Fix Our Dam Roads, it did have a project list. So we have to fit within the constraints of that project list and we are in the process now. Now that we've, in July, put behind us the, the uh, sales tax measure and what we would do there, now we're honing in on what we would do with the with the Fix Our Roads money. You'll see that the, the, the 109 list draws from a version of our CDOT development program. So it was, 
these are projects that you probably all have all seen before, you're all familiar with. Uh, the project costs are expected to be around $5.6 billion for the $3.5 billion question. So the TC's task and what we're doing this week and last week and next week with our planning partners is working to narrow that 5.6 roughly billion list down to what we would build with the 3.5. We can't go beyond, we can't choose different projects. We can't go beyond project limits. We can't build a interchange if it says an intersection. We have to be pretty precise in that project description that we adhere to that. Uh, the commission in two weeks, two weeks from today, will receive a status report on where we're at, working with you all on what those projects should be. And then they may or may not adopt a, a refined project list for the fix our roads question. Uh, if they feel like we've done our job and we've gotten enough input from you all and there's somewhat of a consensus on this, then, then they'll adopt a list. If not, they may say go back and work a little more with our planning partners and, and try to get uh, closer to consensus. So the funding needs and the variables, this is, this is uh, where it gets confusing. Uh, you could, the, green, the green bar on the need list, you can, you can almost pick that number. Uh, as you heard earlier, we have about a billion dollars a year need over the next 20 years. That's a huge deficit that we have to, to maintain the system that we have and to build the system that we need. This shows about a $10 billion need. Um, jumping to the far right side, that's our status quo. So you see the, the orange, the dark orange is Senate Bill 267. In 2017, the legislature passed Senate Bill 267 that said we'll issue $1.8 billion of certificates of participation to benefit transportation projects. <coughs> and the General Assembly will pay that, pay those COPs, the cost, uh, the interest costs back. We would be able to get uh, 1.8 billion we expect that the first tranche of that at about 380 million will come in October. So we're excited to start putting that to good use. Uh, and then we would have three more years each year for the next three years to get to that 1.8 billion. And then the blue line is in every case, Senate Bill 1 this, this year uh, provides about $400 million this year, about $100 million next year for transportation, including local roads, including multimodal. What's reflected here is just for highways. So that's true no matter what happens, we get those two years of Senate Bill 1. So if everything, if everything fails, our status quo is we have just a little bit over $2 billion between 267 and Senate Bill 1 to put towards transportation projects over the next few years. So now let's jump back over to the left-hand side. If 20, uh, if 153, which is uh, now Proposition 110 passes, we still get those Senate Bill 1 dollars in light blue. We still get all of the Senate Bill 267 uh, dollars, which is the 1.8 billion. And then there's about $7 billion more that we can put towards transportation, specifically to highways. This is excluding the local roads that you, local dollars you all would benefit from and the multimodal fund that's that 15%. Uh, if uh, 110 passes, uh, 109, thank you. If 109 passes, we still get the Senate Bill $1. Um, the 267, we only get that first tranche of 267 that we'll get this October of about 380 million. So we, so that's that's there. And then there's the 3.5 billion in uh, that would be general fund proceeds uh, to benefit transportation. So that takes you to about the $4.1 billion for all of those funding sources. Now, if if both of the initiatives, the propositions this, uh, this year fail, Senate Bill 1 from this year would put a ballot question um, in 2019 that would bond for $2.1 billion of projects. So a little bit more than the Senate Bill 267, it would replace the th final three years of 267, which again was $1.5 billion. In exchange, it would be uh, $2.3 billion, so it would be about an $800 million net gain. And then again, we still get the Senate Bill one dollars. So this just is a, a factual summary of, from a highway perspective, uh, what each proposition would give us. And it gets, as as you know, that it gets complicated because what happens with one hundred nine or one hundred ten will dictate whether there's a question in twenty nineteen, and then what happens in twenty nineteen is dictates whether we end up with the status quo or not. 
So that's the quick summary of both propositions and the funding impacts. Happy to answer any questions, and we'll stick around in case there's questions on project development stuff as well. Questions? Start with Mr. Hi. Dr. Elrod. Then we'll have Dr. Uh, Director Flynn. Um, here we go. Okay. So if I heard correctly, um, both of these can pass. Can they pass together, or is it one or the other? Uh, the quick answer is the courts will decide whether the two conflict with each other so greatly that that I think the one with the most votes is the one that wins out. So I think that's the official answer. The informal answer is I don't think there's much about either question that is a pure conflict. I think the real conflict, you, you can have a sales tax and have general fund money go to transportation as well. Uh, you can do most of those things. The only conflict really is this, how they handle the Senate Bill 267 funds. And it, we would speculate whether, the, whether it would make sense for the General Assembly to pay all of the Senate Bill 267 funds and all of the $3.5 in bonds. I suspect a court, if court needed to decide, the court would say 267 goes away because those general fund dollars will be used to pay for the bonds instead of the certificates of participation. But that's speculation. So I think the answer is courts will decide. We think that they, um, they can both pass and be effective. Yeah. Any other questions? Director Williams. Thank you. I, am I mistaken, or is there a legal challenge to SB 267 right now? There is. Uh, there is a, a legal challenge to, to 267. Uh, we have an opinion from our, uh, we being the Treasurer's Office, not CDOT. Treasurer's Office has an opinion that um, that will not prevent the issuance of the first tranche, so they are moving forward with the first tranche of 267. Any other questions? On the phone, do we have any questions? Not hearing any. Um, I'll go ahead and kick it over to Mr. Rex to explain the list that we just passed around, and then that might spark additional questions. No, oh, thank you very much, and I'm going to let Ron get into the the bloody details here in a minute with regards to that list because I know we almost we sent out a version of this last night to you all and um, we hesitated before we did that because we understand there's some nuance to this list and we might have made it more complicated than not to have it but we decided to send it to you anyway um, but there is a couple of updates to that list as a result because um, we did get some additional information from region 4 today about projects that they're considering as part of the proposition 109 so the one we just handed out earlier is wrong so let's throw that away. Oh. The one that Ron <laughs> surprised us with is the one you can use. Oh, it's really confusing. Oh. Everybody got that? The one that says Wednesday on At it. At the very bottom. Oh, they both say it. Never mind. Oh. I don't. Oh, you gave me one. Okay, if it does not say Wednesday at the bottom left-hand corner, throw that one away. Keep the one that says Wednesday, September 5th, in the bottom right-hand corner. So look, 37% for our region instead of 36%. So with all that, Ron, you're up. for our region instead of 40 So they changed some of the... Thanks, everybody. i just sit over here if that's all right. Um, so uh, we did. We sent out a version um, yesterday to the board, um, and I think that's what um, you got. And that was a partial list because we had. So this is a dynamic process, as as um, Herman alluded to. CDOT's going through a process of evaluating the the uh, list of eligible projects under Proposition 109, and then constraining that to the actual three and a half billion dollars that would be authorized by that measure. Um, and so we had received yesterday a draft list from CDOT Region 1. We had not at that point yet received the draft list from Region 4, which you all know has a portion of the Dr. Cog region in it as well. So when we got that new information this morning, we updated and revised this list accordingly. So I'll just walk through and I want to highlight a couple of things. Um, mo the, most of that didn't change, and, and partly it didn't change much because there were, were there are only a couple of eligible projects 
on the Proposition 109 uh, list that are located, that are in Region 4, that are also located in the Dr. Cog region. There are only a couple of those, so it didn't change much. Um, but Region 4 is proposing um, of their target amount of, under that proposition, $40 million to the US 85 corridor improvements. So that's uh, about almost a little more than two thirds of the way down the list under the Proposition 109 column, and then $10 million towards State Highway 66 corridor improvements uh, for that project. So those are the two Region 4 projects that are eligible under Proposition 109 that they are in a draft form proposing to allocate a portion of their target of funding to. I want to highlight on the Region 1 list, at the very top of the list, the first project, I-25 Colorado Springs uh, to Denver South connection. So um, many of you may recall, so that's the managed lane expansion uh, primarily between Castle Rock and, and Monument um, down in the south stretch of I-25, south of the metro area. Um, that has an infra grant. It had funding proposed. Uh, other funding proposed of $100 million, that's the infra grant, that's contribution from so the RT and the RTA down there uh, for a total of $50 million. And then between Senate Bill 1 funding and the first two years of Senate Bill 267, originally was proposing $250 million to fully fund that project. If Proposition 109 were to pass, you'll recall that those last three years of Senate Bill 267 money are no longer available to the state to use. So that leaves a funding gap of $133 million. So Region 1 is proposing that if Proposition 109 passes and Proposition 110 doesn't, then they would allocate $133 million towards that project. Um, similar story on the I-70 West peak period shoulder lane project in Clear Creek County. Um, that that elimination of those last three years of Senate Bill 267 money uh, result in a in a larger funding gap for that project. So Region 1 would propose uh, to allocate $35 million of the $3.5 billion towards that project. Um, I also want to highlight, lastly, at the very bottom of the list, the last three projects on the list represent three projects in the Dr. Cog region that are eligible under Proposition 109, but they were not originally included in the Transportation Commission adopted list of projects to fund if Proposition 110 were to pass. So that's uh, Valley Highway Phase 2 of I-25, that's the I-25 Alameda area project uh, in Denver. Uh, again, those State Highway 66 quarter improvements that Region 4 is proposing to allocate uh, $10 million towards, and the US 85 104th um, Avenue grade separation project in Adams County that again uh, is not being proposed to be funded under Senate Bill 109. So with that I'd be happy to take any questions. I know this gets a little complicated compared to the Proposition 110 sales tax initiative list that the Commission has acted on and the work that is now being undertaken to refine a list uh, in the case that Proposition 109 passes. Yes, Director Jones. Um, I just want to make sure I'm reading your list correctly. Um, am I right in thinking that there's nothing funded in 109 in Boulder County? Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, uh, Director Jones, I believe that's correct, although I that part of State Highway 66 is partially in is Boulder County. So not nothing in Boulder County, but not much. And are there other counties that are also losers under 109? Um, <laughs> Brett, <laughs> Dr. Jones, we I haven't seen the I haven't seen the full statewide list. Uh, I meant in the Dr. Cog region. I haven't done that analysis. Director Rakowski. The answer is Rappo County has nothing under 109. I, I had heard a rumor to that effect. Any other questions? Uh, Director Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, how many years of funding do these two columns, the Prop 109 and 110, uh, uh, one year, that's a multiple? I'll, I'll attempt an answer, and then uh, certainly CDOT can kick me 
correct me, but I think the, the plan that CDOT had developed was projects that they could fund within kind of a 10-year period under Proposition 110 that they felt like they could get those projects done within about a 10-year period. It's a little more complicated under Proposition 109 because of the financing mechanism and the specific language in Proposition 109 that uh, dictates when those bonds have to be issued, but some constraints on how quickly CDOT needs to spend that money. And elaborate on that. Well, um, just so I understand, yeah, I'm, that's all what I, I understand that, but it's so 80, is it right that 80% of the fund, funds would have to be spent in the first three years? Is that right? Uh, yeah, so for IRS tax exempt status, we have to be able to show that we have a plan for 80% of the money to be uh, expended in the first three years. So if the issuance is late June 2019, uh, we would have three years from that date to to try to expend the 80%. We're, we're hard at work because we don't want that to be a limitation. We're hard at work to figure out if there's some like some nuances, some nuances to that. There's ways you can get some waivers. There's ways you can maybe go to five years. So we're looking at all those uh, those opportunities. But one of the things that we've asked our regions to to look at when they consider the the project list is if you don't expect to expend within three years, then that's a project that you should take a harder look at and question whether it should stay on the list. Doug. No, thank you, Herman, for that. And that's that's. I'm glad you hit on that because I I know that was a consideration of the regions as they were submitting projects. What their recommendation would be is you know how quickly they could get to eighty percent. Very much so. Like two seventy, for example, was one of those. Any other questions? Not a Con question. I I would just be remiss, Mr. Chair, if I didn't mention. So at the at the bottom of the columns under Proposition 110 and Proposition 109, there's just a little bit of analysis of sort of the Dr. Cog regional share of the state highway portion of both of those measures. Um, and so under Proposition 110, those proposed fundings would return to Dr. the Dr. Cog region between the projects in Region 4 and the projects in Region 1 portion of Dr. Cog about 42% of the roughly six and a half billion dollars of state highway projects statewide, whereas under Proposition 109, that return would be about 37%. And obviously that number's in still a little bit of a, a flux, but to get to sort of about a 40% return to the Dr. Cog region, which has historically been sort of the target we've collectively advocated for would take an investment under Proposition 109 in the Dr. Cog region of about another $103 million worth of projects. Thank you, Ron, for that clarification. Any other questions? None. I think any questions off the phone? I should ask them real quick. This is Stephanie Walton. Um, I, was, I have two questions. One, um, I was just wondering if we could get an updated list emailed to us for those of us who are not there. And also, I had a question about one of the charts in the packet, um, the chart that starts on page 53 in the packet. It's just following the Let's Go Colorado 110 presentation. It lists all of the cities, and then there's a county list um, of revenue from the tax increase. And I'm not quite sure how to read that. Is, it, is the increase the differential between um, the columns there. Thank you. We're trying to get you an answer, letting staff. Mr. Chair, Director, the so the agent the um, list there is. The, the first column is the current distribution for fiscal year 17 um, to each of the cities in the city list and the counties in the county list. The next column over is the um, increased distribution that would result in the first year of the sales tax initiative if that initiative were to pass. Um, so I'm looking at Aguilar and their, their 
2017 distribution was $23,276. If the uh, sales tax initiative were to pass, they would get an additional $29,645 in the first year of that uh, measure being effective. And I think this is showing an analysis over 20 years of revenue, the life of that sales tax increase under the measure of $838,346. I don't. I don't know if it's additional twenty nine thousand. I think there wouldn't that be rebaselined at twenty nine thousand. Mr. Chair, it is an additional. It is additional. It's okay. Additional. All right. So in in most cases under under Prop uh, one ten, all cities would get at least would increase their HUTF share by a hundred percent or more. It's about double what they get now. Any other questions? All righty, Doug. Mr. Chairman, if I may, real quick, just to put a bow on this. Um, so, and, and this is true for the next item as well. So we're bringing these to your attention tonight, first as an education, if you're not too aware with the initiatives, but also um, we would ask uh, just for you all to think about if there are any of these initiatives that you would like to take a position on, and we would do that at the September 19th board meeting. So um, I just we can have that conversation now, or we can have a conversation at the end of Rich's um, summary of all the all the uh, initiatives. So may maybe we should wait till then. Director Shaw. Thank you. Okay, I think. Um, so my question goes back to this. <clears throat> this chart that that uh, Director Walton brought up does is are the projections over twenty years based on uh, a fixed situation that exists today, as if there were no change happen, and if changes happen, how might those changes influence the the distribution? So if I was to go off of Mayor Williams' presentation as well as I've seen a similar presentation on this, um, there is a, a, a factor in there that increases sales over time. So it's not a flat rate. So if you try to do the math, it won't come out right because there's an anticipated increase in sales revenue. So uh, what's, for example, if um, uh, Aguilar that we're looking at triples in size and uh, and gets all sorts of new roads that are needed, would Aguilar get a larger funding um, <clears throat> as a percentage or a, as a distribution rate because of the change in its circumstance? I, I don't know that answer oh, okay. for sure. Ms. Mr. Go ahead, uh, director, I, I, I don't think that that level of valuation was put into place. I, my understanding is it was sort of a, an average annual increase in sales tax revenue of okay. 3% per year as an average. Obviously, there will be ups and downs as there historically are in economic activity around the state. And so some years it may be lower or a decline, and some years that increase might be higher. I think the the ocean of that analysis that was done, uh, not by us, uh, was to try to get at least some sense of what 20 years worth of revenue would be to each jur to each jurisdiction, but did not take into account any sort of system changes that might affect the HUTF formula. And and maybe if I could just to add to that, Ron's exactly right from the sales tax perspective and the percentages. All it does is it ties to the HUTF formula. However, the HUTF formula is based, for instance, for cities is based in part, say, on, on vehicle registrations that are happening in your community. So if Aguilar has huge growth and their vehicle registrations go up, that would be reflected in both their regular HUTF dollars as well as their sales tax. So thank you. Well, maybe if I didn't listen to Doug Rex letting the mayor go so early, we would have had an answer and a sacrificial lamb here. Rex. Any other questions? Oh, yep. Uh, Director Elrod. 
Sorry, I have another clarifying question. This is for the CDOT presentation where it had Proposition 110 um, compared to Proposition 109, how much money is generated. So maybe three slides up. That one. Here. So the Proposition 110 <clears throat> could generate up to 18 billion, of which 6 billion is bonded. Is that how I read that? Yes, about 18 billion and up to 6 billion in bonds are authorized. Compared to 109 is essentially capped at the 3.5 billion. Correct. Is that good? Okay. Would it be a true statement if I were to say to someone who lives in Arapahoe County, uh, there will be under Proposition 109, 3.5 billion of your tax dollars from general revenues that would counter against education, very competing interests. Okay. 3.5 billion for state highways, none of which will go to Arapahoe County. That it would be a correct statement to say that. It would be a correct statement to say that none of the funds would be would be constructed within Arapahoe County. Certainly, there the residents of Arapahoe County would benefit from some of the other projects that are not contained in their county. I two I two twenty five from Yosemite to I twenty five, for instance, there would be a benefit. But it is true, none of it is actually expended in Arapahoe County. None of it is expended, and the when you talk about the the um, extension of the highway from Denver to Colorado Springs. It's not Denver to Colorado Springs. It's Castle Rock to Denver. Springs. Is that correct? Castle Rock to Monument. Yeah. Okay. I want to make sure I'm representing things correct. Any other questions or comments? Like I say that so many times, I think we can move on, right? We good? Anything on the um, phone? Anyone wants a question or comment? Yes, Director Jones. Just a clarification. The uh, intention is that Dr. Cog will vote on both of these at the September 19th meeting, or do we need to put in that request to you now that we have? Well, Director Jones, that's a great question. Um, I think I would, you know, we can definitely have both of these available for, for whatever you want to do with them. Uh, if there's you know, if there's a desire just to, I know we can't vote at this meeting, of course, even maybe even suggest that we just vote on one or, or the other, but um, I'd kind of throw it open and ask for, for your guidance on this and how to do it. Well, then I, can I follow up my question with a comment then? Possibly. Okay. Go ahead, Director Jones. <laughs> Why don't you say it and then I'll decide if I want to accept it. My preference, if I were given guidance, is that we vote um, to support um, 110 and oppose 109 at our next meeting. Uh, Director Rakowski. I would ask the chair to ask for a s s consensus of, in the way of a strong vote, to, uh, to accomplish, have both 109 and 110 on the agenda for a vote. And what's the pleasure of the board? Uh, let's do thumbs up if you'd like to see it on our agenda to do a vote both propositions. Okay. Looks like we'll be putting that onto the uh, agenda for September 19th. Yes, Director Vinton. Um, just following the uh, current line of uh, questioning, I'm uh, curious if uh, 109 was to prevail, what would the outcome be for uh, Adams County? So um, if you look on page 41, it shows that Proposition 109, I haven't added all these up and maybe maybe Ron's doing that as we speak, but at least I can speak to the projects that are in, in 109. Um, so 
So let me see here. So we got I-25 US 36 to 120th. I-25 US 36 to State Highway 7. I, well, I-270 is not proposed right now, but, but advancing a portion of that. So there's 25 million that's set aside for that project. Yeah, right, as opposed to the 233 or whatever it was uh, in uh, Proposition 110. Um, it's the same with the, the 270, well, 270 US 85, I guess that's the same same thing, Ron. Um, yeah. And then uh, US 85, 104th is not recommended for, to move forward. Uh, US, US 85, 120th is. Is, yeah, US 85 120th is. I'll give you some feel for your projects. Thank you. Yes, uh, Director uh, Deck. There you go. I would like to know what confidence that you have that the legislature will find the money to actually pay the obligation? Great face. You're asking me? <laughs> <laughs> Ask Mr. Mr. Lewis. I agree with Connie. Um, yeah. Great question. Um, I don't have a crystal ball. You all have more experience with the upswings and downswings of economy here in Colorado and where the demands are for general fund revenues. And I believe Herman lived through Senate Bill 1 previously where funds were allotted and then things got tough and they went away. And so that's the risk. I mean, there is a, there, there's a risk there that the debt on that $3.5 billion could end up being back on CDOT's budget, which would the only place to come from is our asset management program. But I can't predict that. Director Rakowski. Answer Director Dick's comment. To say that a mandate from the voters does not translate into a legislative mandate. Up to the legislature to read the uh, political winds. Best you can ask. From our Godfather. Um, any other questions? You know, Jefferson County only has two on that list. All right. Four? I thought it was two. four and three. Four on two, the both lists and. Oh, on, yeah, I'm looking at that. And they got 470, 285, Morrison Road, Heritage. Lodge. Oh, I Ron see. Ten. Yeah. yeah, I think I. All right. Are we done with this one. Are we ready to move to the next one? Great. So we're going to go ahead and close that one. I want to thank our guests for coming out and speaking to us this evening. And we're going to move on to a discussion on the non-transportation ballot initiative. We're going to have a probably a little bit lighter conversation and I believe Rich you're on you're up as Rich is getting settled there um, you know there are 13 total yeah there are 13 total that are on the on the ballot this coming November um, two of which are the ones we just talked about um, so Rich is just gonna quickly run through all of those I mean quickly really quick and uh, but there are there are a few on there um, four, maybe five, that we believe are related to Dr. Cog's mission and the role that we have here, um, and some we're dealing with, um, you know, local control issues, stuff that we've taken positions on in the past, and he'll highlight those, and we'll get into a larger conversation. Director Rakowski. Real quick, a technical item that Rich um, probably won't get into the weeds. This list is not final until 5 o'clock on Friday. Still is the possibility of a withdrawal, not in addition, but the withdrawal. And there is some movement behind the scenes in that regard. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, and to supplement that, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, the uh, 
Colorado Legislative Council, which is sort of the board for the state legislature, its leadership in legislature, is meeting tomorrow to review the blue book, uh, which is the staff prepared summary uh, and analysis of all the initiative and referenda tomorrow morning. And uh, so they, they will have that taken care of. I think also to add on to uh, what Director Rakowski just said, the, uh, I think the Secretary of State is saying uh, they will be officially assigning those prop num proposition numbers uh, on Monday the 10th. And then I think the blue book should be published by the end of September or before the end of September. With that, um, there, as Doug mentioned, there there are thirteen measures on the ballot as of now. Six of them are um, referrals or referenda from the referrals from the legislature. Uh, there's uh, Amendment V, and and let me also mention that there's a couple. Of, there will be a couple of changes uh, to the memo that that was sent out because there were, I think two at the back that subsequently made it to the ballot. So I'll try to not get you confused on that slight change. Um, but from referred from the legislature this past session is Amendment V. Uh, and, and keep in mind that these referrals all take a two-thirds majority vote of the legislature to, to get on the ballot, to actually pass and get on the ballot. So that clearly takes uh, bipartisan support on these uh, proposals. Um, Amendment V is uh, changing, lowers actually, the age requirement for serving in the state legislature. It's currently 21. This would lower it, lower it to, I mean, it's currently 25 and would lower it to 25, 21, sorry. Um, and I'm just going to kind of like before s s shoot through these and if you want to stop me and ask questions, I'll, I'll probably refer, refer the answer to somebody else. Um, Amendment W changes would change the way the ballot looks on the question if you recall most elections we we are asked about retention of judges and we're asked do you want to keep this judge on this particular court yes or no this is just going to change the look of how those are presented uh, on the ballot and you there's you can go to uh, the legislature's website to see how the the actual ballot would change, but it's just an, a, an attempt, apparently, to clarify um, how those retentions are presented to voters. Um, Amendment X takes out the uh, definition of industrial hemp that was put in the Colorado Constitution and puts it in the statute, uh, and in order to uh, make it automatically aligned with uh, the federal definitions and to be able to have the state um, make any changes according to federal law more easily if, if that definition stays in the Constitution and federal law changes in between elections then Colorado would be out of compliance with federal law until the next election and we'd have to put something on the ballot um, amendment Y and actually Amendment Z are uh, essentially companion uh, measures that many of you may have heard about that came together to, uh, toward the end of the session really is a bipartisan uh, effort to take politics, I guess, out of uh, the redistricting, which is for uh, that happen. And this is what happens after they redraw the boundaries after the census. So there'll be another one after the 2020 census. Congressional redistricting is f is for the seven, potentially eight, uh, congressional districts, and then the uh, reapportionment is drawing the the state house and the state senate districts. And both of these would set up 12 member con commissions with. Uh, I think it's four Democrats, four Republicans, and four um, uh, independents or unaffiliated. And there's a whole lot more detail to that, but, but that's going forward. Um, I would say, and I, I was going to try to highlight a couple um, on going forward uh, of s supporters and oppo uh, opposition to, on some of these, both 
uh, Amendment Y and Amendment Z, I noted that uh, Pro 15 and Club 20 uh, have uh, come out in support of both of those, and there's a whole bunch of uh, elected officials and former elected officials, former secretaries of state and so forth that are supporting those. Um, Amendment A is um, a also a referral, but it's an amendment because it's a constitutional change. Uh, or actually, it's, it's A because we're, they're going over the, they're starting around the second round of the, out, out of the alphabet. So, because um, they, that's how the, the, they changed how these uh, referrals go. Um, and this one is essentially the same as one that actually failed in 2016 uh, that would uh, take out of the Constitution an exception uh, that is in our Constitution for there's prohibition against slavery and involuntary servitude, and servitude unless someone is in prison, basically. And this would, would uh, take that exception out of the Constitution. And uh, so it, there's, I guess, with some evidence uh, the last election that there was a lot of confusion over whether if they were if they voted yes they were supporting slavery or if they voted no they were supporting slavery so uh hopefully the the proponents and, and again this was a bipartisan legislative referral uh they're hoping that it's worded more uh clearly uh for voters this time uh that would take us to i believe it it's the seven initiatives that are on the ballot and of course we've already talked about two of them um First two initiatives I'll mention are uh, amend constitutional amendments. Uh, amendment 73 uh, is the funding for public schools uh, initiative uh, that is on the ballot. And um, that one would uh, increase uh, the uh, individual income tax rate on incomes over 150,000 and would also in increase the state corporate income tax rate all to help fund uh, education, and it, would all, it also has a component where it makes changes to the Gallagher Amendment by uh, setting the residential assessment rate at uh, 7% and the uh, assessment rate for commercial properties at 24%. Um, the next one I've got is Amendment 74. And um, that's the one that was previously known as Initiative 108. The uh, I shorthand call it the takings one. That's the I titled just compensation for reduction in fair market value by government law or regulation. I've noted in some of my research that Pro 15 and Club 20. Uh, Pro 15 has no position. Club 20 opposes it. CML strongly opposes it. Uh, and let me note also that, um, as I understand it, last conversation I had was on uh, Colorado counties, is they are planning to take positions on initiative and referenda at a um, county meeting in, on September 28th. So I don't know what positions, they don't have official positions yet at the counties. Yes. Um. Many of you know I'm a land use planning attorney, and uh, the result of this initiative would, in essence, mean that no city could really afford to have land use planning. So I've nicknamed it the Turning Us Into Texas One Explosion at a Time initiative because Texas does not have land use planning, and Colorado does. So, Secretary Rukowski, I'm sorry. Well, we're on 108, I would be remiss if I did not recognize the mayor of Boulder, Suzanne Jones, for her exceptional leadership trying to defeat. In fact, she has thrown her heart and soul into this with a passion that I've never seen before. Well, Mayor, this is... Uh... Aaron from Boulder, uh, appreciate that. I'll, I'll pass that along to Mayor Jones. Thank you, Aaron. Rich? Okay, and then on my list, that takes us to... I'm sorry. Director Jones, oh. did you have something? No, no, go ahead. 
We'll get these mics down one day. Hard talk. No. Oh, sorry. I wanted to thank the good mayor for his kind words about my sister. I also wanted to point out in this particular measure that a similar measure passed in Oregon. Um, it only was in, in um, law for, th I think, three years. During that time, they got nearly 7,000 taking claims, totaling about $20 billion. Um, the state had to pay out $4 billion before the citizens overturned it, in concerns that it was going to bankrupt the state. Thank you. Which? Oh, um, Director uh, Henry. <laughs> I can talk loud. <laughs> um, Adams County will be. I need to. Adams County neighbors across the street. It's going to be too. And the writing stable could take the opposite view. You can't. You don't do in that it. case, if you don't do it, you just. No. Good one. Good one. On <laughs> That's next. Director Stolzman. Thank you, uh, Chair. So, just seeing the um, amount of interest in this one, I suggest that we forward this for consideration at the work at the regular meeting this month. We want to go through all these or do them one by one. I mean, I think as we continue on, but it just seems like there's enough interest to forward this We can this recap on for at discussion. the end, too. Maybe what we'll do is we'll recap which ones we'd like to bring back to the board to vote along with the other. Okay. Any other questions oh, before we move on with uh, Rich? Hey, Rich. Okay. And, and the next two, uh, Proposition 109 and Proposition 110, obviously you've had a lot of talk about already, so I'll move on to Proposition 111, which deals with payday loans um, in current law. Um, payday loans are uh, capped, I think, at 45% per year, uh, but on a number of different uh, renewals and uh, fees and origination charges and so forth are allowed so that the effective insure or, uh, interest rate can be much higher. This initiative would put a hard cap of 36% annual percentage rate on payday loans. Um, and the 112, which um, was the previous initiative 197, is the setback requirement that I think everybody almost has been opposing, it looks like. Uh, um, but uh, that's the one that would change the setback requirements to 2,500 feet. Um, and, and the last one I have is uh, Proposition 113, which I think just officially made the ballot yesterday, um, and that uh, deals with campaign contributions and basically uh, says that if a candidate loans or contributes uh, at least a million dollars of, of their own money to their campaign, then other candidates in that particular race uh, are allowed to collect five times the normal campaign limit. And um, that, as I said, that one just made the ballot. So those, those, that's the list of all 13. I'm personally really glad that we have uh, mail ballots so that I can spend time at home <laughs> figuring these out <laughs> before I vote. Uh, Bob. Escalator cause in that 173. Um, I don't. No, I don't it's think a million so. Million dollars. It's going into the Constitution is a fixed number. Yeah, you know that's a good question. I don't. I'd have to double check. Um, it says at least, so I'd have to double check. Like if it got, uh, if the compensation or compensatory amount got higher, if you contributed 10 million or something. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. Any other questions? Going back to Director uh, Stolzman's uh, request, I'd like to know, uh, Director Flynn. 
Thank you. On the uh, education one, there's that Gallagher uh, matter that's addressed in there and just some quick math, which is always dangerous on the fly. It would look like it would translate into a property tax increase for residential property of about 35, 38%. Is that? That's higher than I think I've seen. I don't have it off the top of my head, but that seems pretty, pretty high to me okay. from what I've seen. It'd be nice before our board meeting to have that worked out by lower, we're, the, the rate right now is just 7.2, correct? Residential? Yeah, and it could, go it, down even, it could go down even farther, yeah. But it would lower it, but it would fix it at 7 in perpetuity. Yes. Yeah. And it would fix the 29% to 24%, which is a much more substantial drop on a larger number, which results in residential picking up uh, a right. significant greater share. All right, it'd be nice to know what that is before the board okay. meeting. Thank you. So let's, uh, let me pose the question. I don't think we're going to, do we want to put all these in the, in the uh, meeting? I think some of this I is outside not. of the scope of Dr. Cog. So if I was to recap, to stay within our, if we color within our lines, I would assume it would be initiative uh, 108. Which is oh. amendment 74. I'm going by page 69 sure. in the packet. Yeah. And yeah. as presented, that's, that's, yeah, that's uh, proposition 110. Proposition 109, and anything else? Anything else? Those are those are the ones we've heard so far. As far as that are putting done. on for the board consideration, if you want to suggest any others, yeah. Um, but I can if, whether we put the edu education one on for the board consideration or not, we'll still get you an answer. But thank you. I'm just wondering the impact, uh, Chair. Yes. I'm just wondering the impact that it might have on our on our programs that we fund at the municipal level through property tax. Some of the districts, or some of the municipalities that are have heavier commercial or non-residential uh, revenue from property tax could be affected more than those that are heavily residential. Any thoughts from other directors on putting uh, Amendment 73 on discussion at least uh, at the next meeting? For, you, want to, you want to discuss it? Okay. Well, Richard Dale. If, if we were going to put it on, then I'd like to have a listing of property tax other states. I mean, having traveled my life in the Air Force, our, tra our, t our, our residential taxes are pretty low. For example, I owned a house in San Antonio, Texas that paid 104000 for and my property tax was six thousand a year, so it's it's weird what across the nation, and we get so used to what we pay. But so I don't I don't really have a axe to grind on where we put this at Dr. Cog, but I do have an axe to grind. We're going to talk about it to have a comparison between us and other states, so we could uh, have somewhat of a level playing field. Thank you, Judge Selzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so what we do in Louisville is we, we try really hard to look at what our scope of, what, what we're required to look at. And, and from my perspective, this is outside of what Dr. Cog really looks at. It's very important and I care quite a lot about it, but I don't think it's a matter um, that the board necessarily should take a position on. Uh, but if the board does want to decide, uh, that's perfectly fine. I just know Louisville will abstain um, because we won't. We don't take matter. We won't take up this kind of matter in, at our jurisdictional level. Richard Flynn. Thank you, and I, I would have the same question about 108. Then also, uh, you know, what is the tie to our our scope with 108 yeah. that is not also pertinent with the uh, education, uh, because it affects our it affects our bottom line, our ability to carry out programs. Director Rakowski? Let me answer my thoughts to eminent gentleman from Rocky Mountain News. Uh, I think the answer is particularly on 108, if you're looking to add a right turn lane section in your city, that could easily be the subject of a 108. I think it's, from a traffic point of view, it's very substantially into what we yeah director jones and i'll come back to director fun okay. 
Um, I was just going to um, echo what the mayor was saying about, I think, the, the any local land use and transportation decisions would now be subject to uh, lawsuits. And there, I, think, I think, therefore, our ability as local governments to uh, regionally uh, further the goals of MetroVision would really be paralyzed. So I, I actually do see 108 or Amendment 74 as directly related to Dr. Cog business. Director Flint. And when we talk about seniors and aging and housing issues, um, I, already we are talking about the senior homestead exemption every year. Will it be fully funded? Will it not be fully funded? As we drive up uh, property taxes, now, I moved here from New Jersey 30 some years ago and I'm still paying less here on my house than I did in New Jersey 30 years 30, ago. 38 years ago. Uh, so I, I do understand the imbalance, but it's a matter of what the what the regimen is right now and what what the what people are paying. That sticker shock in the first year, uh, I'm wondering what th that could do to the homestead exemption and the ability to fund it, uh, the reimbursement to the cities and the counties. Uh, so I think that that has an impact on some of our programs on aging. That's, that's really deep into the rabbit hole. I pulled that one out. Thank you. And if I might, Mr. Chairman, also, I, I just know for a point of information on the, the takings issue, Dr. Cog Board has had a longstanding policy um, that's renewed every year in our state policy statement where we address uh, regulatory takings issues and basically support existing uh, law and court rulings. So this, I think, would definitely go in against the standing board policy. And I just wanted to see if I could get one last clarification because it sounds like we're getting close to being done. But um, some in previous years, we have often put together resolutions for the board to adopt, but. I don't know if that's making sense in the way the conversation's gone, but I wanted to ask what the preference of the board is. When we come back to the board meeting in two weeks, do you just want to take a position or do you want to adopt a resolution? Because I'm thinking if we'd have to pres we'd have to adopt a support and an opposed resolution to see which one you 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 vote on. But I'm I just wanted some clarification. Well, I mean, I, I don't know what the value of that would be, Rich, to be yeah. honest with you. I mean, I think it's, if the board, at their pleasure, does take a position, I think that speaks, speaks strongly enough. I mean, yeah, I, I, I just wanted to clarify. Thank you. And I want to go back to the conversation with your rabbit you pulled out of the hat. Um, do we want Amendment 73 to come back with more information or not? Can we ask staff to... Um, Bring us back information as it might pertain to impacts of our programs. Yes. Okay. Uh, Director Rakowski. If we're going to compare state property tax rates, remember there are some states like Texas and Florida that do not have a state income tax. There. Wyoming, it just becomes, I think, very difficult to weigh it. Oh, I'm good on that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Want to summarize them? Yes. Okay. And if you want. I just want to make sure I, I understand. Let's let right. let's let Doug summarize okay. so we know that staff's <laughs> on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, okay, so as presented, I'm not going to talk about the, the new numbers and all that kind of good stuff. So so what we'll bring back is Amendment 73, Initiative 108. Uh, Which is amendment was it the same as Amendment 74? Okay, you can see. Okay. <laughs> Fair market as, value one. As presented. Right. As presented. Uh, proposition 110, Proposition 109. The one we did not bring this one up yet. And the one we did not bring up with, we know that it's on pending a decision by Friday, is Initiative 97. That's a setback one. Um, is that one we also want? That's, that's the other one that we felt was somewhat related to Dr. Cosworth. Director Jones. I'm not sure that, I, I would argue that that's not part of Dr. Cog's purview. I would also um, correct um, Rich's statement that everybody's in opposition since uh, I come I, from a jurisdiction I, I tried that is to qualify endorsed it. it. <laughs> so, but I, I don't see how this, this um, really falls into Dr. Cog's wheelhouse. It's an enormously controversial issue and I don't know why we'd step in it. 
It sounds good to me. I'm good with it. The only thing is it talks about water and then some of our uh, plans and so forth. We talk about water quality. So I just want to throw it out there that it could easily be thrown in there, but we'll let it sit. But yeah, so we'll bring those back. All We're right. Adjourned. We're adjourned. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, everybody. Uh, good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. oh,